The Stony Creek Jane Doe, 1987, identified as Linda Jean McClure. In October of 1987, there was a crash on the turnpike near Stony Creek Township when a tractor trailer rear ended a semi truck. The tractor trailer would catch fire as it was a fuel tank that the semi in front of them was carrying. The two occupants of the tractor trailer were caught in the fire, and while the driver was identified as 57 year old Edward Pratt from Fontana, California, the female passenger couldn't be identified. Pratt was working, and he wasn't allowed to have anyone with him without obtaining prior permission, and he'd had none. It was suspected that the woman with him may have been hitchhiking and was perhaps picked up at a nearby truck stop. The authorities entered her into NamUs, but there weren't any possible hits. It would take until August of 2022 that the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission would approach the idea of forensic genealogy. This is another we owe to the technology of Othram Labs. Thanks to the hard work and an in-house investigation, it would eventually lead to Linda's brother. It was proven that the woman who was in the tractor trailer was, in fact, Linda Jean McClure, who was 26 at the time the accident happened, and she was from Indiana, Pennsylvania. Her family would share that they last spoke to Linda in the 1980s and confirm that she had not been reported missing. As with a lot of these cases, people who lived a transient life don't get reported missing because to their family, they're already missing. Finally, her family would have answers. Linda Jean McClure went unidentified for 35 years. Had she lived, she would be 61 today. The Beaver Creek John Doe, 1981, identified as Louis Gitano. This case starts out in Beaver Creek Township, Minnesota. While clearing out a concrete culvert at I-90 and Rocky City Road 23, a Department of Transportation worker happened upon skeletal remains. The ditch and culvert had last been cleared on October 21, 1980, and no remains were found at that time, at least none that were reported. The reason this is a little sketchy and matters is that the remains would turn out to be from a man who was missing in 1971, a decade earlier than he was found. Thanks to the DNA Doe Project, in December of 2022, Louis Catano once again had his name. Louis was 25 when he was last seen, but as mentioned, he was last seen in 1971. It was not Minnesota he went missing from either. He was last seen in Omaha, Nebraska. How he traveled those 200 miles, and if he was alive when that happened, is a complete mystery. The weird thing, however, is that the skeleton was wearing clothes. He had on green work pants, boxer shorts, green socks, and a light tan engineer-type boots. He had with him a small locket with the photo of a baby inside. The cause of his passing was a GS wound to his head. It doesn't seem logical that a decade could have passed with him still wearing his clothing and him having been moved there from somewhere else. So likely, whoever was supposed to be cleaning that culvert annually wasn't doing so. According to the examination, he was 30 to 50 years old and approximately 5 foot 7. There's always the possibility, however, that maybe the people had been cleaning that culvert and he was somewhere else for those nine years. It's not clear if they had any sort of estimate for how long he'd been there. Investigators are urging that anyone who recognizes or had contact with him between 1971 and 1981, please contact the sheriff's tip line at area code 507-283-5000. Lewis went unidentified for 41 years, and he was missing for 51 The Hillsborough County Jane Doe, 1971, identified as Catherine Ann Alston. Kathy Alston lived a pretty good life in Boston, Massachusetts, at least up until 1971. She had attended Boston University, marrying young, but by 26 she was divorced, although those who know her say this wasn't acrimonious. She wasn't having any difficulty at all with her ex. In fact, they would say she hadn't had problems with anyone. 
Her family had decided as a group to move to Texas, and up until that point, she was living with a roommate. She would make the decision that she too was going to move with them. Everyone packed up and they bought tickets and they would arrive at the airport. Everyone that is, except for Kathy. She didn't show up and her family would never see or hear from her again. Something must have happened to her around the time she was to leave for the airport. And the thing her family didn't know was that her remains would be found on October 6th, 1971. At the end of Kilton Road in Bedford, New Hampshire. This was in a Manchester suburb located near the highway bypass. It was estimated she'd been there one to three months. There is a statement in one of the articles regarding this case that Kathy was never reported missing. I feel like I need to say that I no longer take this at face value, and I don't think anyone else should. In a case like this, it would be odd that she wasn't reported missing, especially when she had tickets and didn't show. It appears that quite often family will say that they gave a missing person report and there's no record of it. It disappeared over the years. So I suspect that according to the record, no one reported her missing to mean, meaning they don't have any proof she was reported missing. Not so much that it didn't happen. The missing person reports at the time were on paper and over years, they just seemed to disappear in many different jurisdictions. Additionally, if they had reported her missing, it was probably her parents who are no longer alive and can't be asked. So I just want to be clear, there might be a discrepancy between this video and what's written out there. We do know that the police had tried many times in order to try to identify her, and there are three distinctly different recreations of what she could have looked like. This case might actually have been solved years ago, if not for a change that happened at Jedmatch. It turns out that the police had turned to genetic DNA, and so did one of Kathy's siblings. That sibling purchased a test and then uploaded it to GEDmatch, and I would be shocked if some of the reason she did it wasn't partially in hopes of finding out what happened to Kathy. However, GEDmatch made a change in their policy and took all of the existing DNA samples and marked it as not being able to be searched for. Anyone who had uploaded their GED match for this would have to have come back in, logged in, and ticked the box that said it was okay to search the DNA. It had been changed so that you had to opt in. And unfortunately, Kathy's sister didn't do this. As a result, that pool to search through shrunk massively, and it's my understanding they tried with no results and ended up putting the search aside for a later date. A few years would pass and GEDmatch would pivot again and allow for searching. So just recently when those covering her case checked again, they would discover that there was in fact updated matches. And Kathy's sister's DNA kit would provide the answer that they needed. As of January 9th, 2023, Kathy again had a name. The police are asking for assistance. Kathy had a roommate named David Cormier and they lived on Beacon Street across from Boston Common. The police need to speak to him in order to obtain information about Kathy's movements. Anyone with information about Cormier, who likely lives in Boston, Dorchester, or Somerville, or did at one point, or also Kathy's movements herself, it is asked that you contact authorities at the number on the screen. Kathy Alston went unidentified for 51 years. Had she lived, she would be 77 years old today. As always, thank you so much for watching. The current goal for the channel is 20,000 subscribers. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss new episodes. Thank you so much to everybody commenting. Even with just an emoji, it really has made a big difference. Without it, there isn't a channel. So thank you guys so much. Take care of yourselves and each other.